I'll leave you to it. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, I'm very happy to be here at the Groovy Track of ApacheCon. And um, so you can't see it from the camera, but I'm wearing an, a great Conf t-shirt, which I was wearing for tonight to get a, a little bit more in the Groovy and Conference spirit. And um, today I'm talking about uh, blockchain and um, a little bit about the history and the context of blockchain and specifically Ethereum as blockchain technology but then uh, especially how to interact with it using the JVM. And of course we have the Groovy track, so for using Groovy to interact with it. But we will also see an example how to build your own blockchain in Groovy as a, as a small, cool teaser. Okay, a little bit about myself. My name is Kevin Wittek. And uh, last year I switched uh, from the industry, from being a software engineer back into uh, academia. And I'm now doing my PhD at the Institute for Internet Security in uh, Gelsenkirchen in Germany. And I'm leading there also the blockchain research lab. Um, and I'm, I'm doing a, a PhD on the topic of distributed systems engineering, but more specifically actually on, uh, on blockchain. So um, therefore I, I, I jumped into this whole field of blockchain and I wasn't in, in blockchain as a topic uh, or in the blockchain community before. So I just started out last year and it took me quite some time to get into this whole field and in the topics and into the community. And uh, it also took me some time to like and appreciate it. But nowadays I think it's a really cool technology and a really cool community and it's really worth understanding it. I don't say everyone needs to use it and it needs to be part of every system or every application, uh, but it is very, very cool to know about what blockchain and what blockchain infrastructure might bring in the future for certain classes of applications or certain classes of um, security properties or whatever. Uh, and uh, yeah, mo most know me probably from being a maintainer of the test containers project, test containers Java, and I'm the author of the uh, test container Spock extension. So that's um, where no most people know me from. And I'm an Oracle Groundbreaker ambassador. And these are some of the uh, other blockchain activities I'm now involved in. Blocksburg is one of my favorite ones. Uh, it is an, a scientific blockchain network run by universities and so on and, and free to use basically Ethereum based. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm just checking if I can see the chat. So if you want, basically in between, you can also always ask me questions. So I'm happy to engage in a more or less interactive ways with you. If you have something on point during the talk, so just ask or else we come to the questions after after the talk roughly mm. um yes so maybe paul can you write into the uh, chat when the talk should be over and we start the qa uh, that would be slightly helpful uh, i think it will be 20 past 10 or but i'm not 100 sure um i like to a little bit give a um, intro into the historic context uh, but i will not dive too deep into this but I like to uh, nowadays explain blockchain and blockchain concepts actually as a historic development that started with the development of the time sharing systems, time sharing operating systems in the 60s and in the 70s. And here we see a picture of Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie in the 70s, basically while they were um, inventing, um, uh, inventing Unix. Okay, I can take a bit longer, all right. <laughs> um, so, um, but still, I, I will jump a little bit about some of these more historic uh, topics, but um, cool, great. Uh, if you, uh, it is possible, I think, to build a narr narrative with regards to, to blockchain as a, a infrastructure, as a technology that starts in the 60s with the vision the original developers of the time-sharing operating systems had. Because the idea of the time-sharing operating system at this time was to model uh, computing resources as a utility, comparable to something like the telephone network or electrical utilities, the power grid, etc. And then we have different steps in the history of computing and utility computing that uh, expand on this idea. And I think it's fine to say 
that the internet as we know it and the internet as the World Wide Web is kind of a utility computing infrastructure that we all use just as an utility that is a shared resource for all of us. Um, and um, with the uh, rise of cloud computing in the 2000s with AWS, and now we have all the other providers, the concept of utility computing and computing as a resource became even more widespread. But at the same time, we now have a movement that the utility computing became actually more centralized. The internet at its core is very decentralized, but the clouds are centralized toward the big vendors. So which is a bit uh, counterintuitive if we look at the original visions of the internet. And I would argue that the ideas of the blockchain networks and the first one that was widespread was the Bitcoin network uh, is again moving towards a, a, a better network that is more decentralized. And Bitcoin is basically a decentralized state machine. Yes, it is a way or is, is a peer to peer electronic cash system, but at its core, it's a decentralized state machine that is self synchronizing in the network. But it's just state. And then 2015 with Ethereum, we have this programmable decentralized state machine. That's pretty cool. So um, Ethereum uh, runs a quasi Turing uh, complete virtual machine that is at the same time a decentralized state machine. And it's quasi Turing complete because uh, it has a protection against infinite loops built in. So therefore it is not Turing complete by the concrete definition of Turing complete, but it's a, a programmable world computer with a decentralized state and something that's called rich state because you see the history of all the states the state machine had in the past. So there's a pretty cool idea behind this whole technology. And um, we have now these different networks coming up, blockchain based networks. And um, what we see currently in the industry and in the technology and also in academia is that um, people strive to get more interoperability between the networks. So we have this really global public networks, but we have some efforts by the European Union to build a European network for certain use cases, especially in the, in the area of e-government, etc. And we might be able in the future to have a network of networks with good interoperability for certain features, like, for example, identity and decentralized identity. Okay. So um, one interesting thing is the concept of trust. So um, this Bitcoin stuff and the blockchain stuff always says with blockchain, you don't need to rely on trust. So this is a quote from the original Bitcoin paper from Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a pseudonymous, so no one knew, knows at the moment who uh, invented Bitcoin, so to say. And he says here, we have proposed a system for electronic transaction without relying on trust. Uh, but I would argue that is not true. So Bitcoin is still relying on trust. It is just moving the trust to a different layer. It is actually defining or inventing a new kind of a trust architecture. And we like to call this distributed trust architecture. Classical uh, trust can be peer to peer. One person trusts another. Leviathan, we are trusting in, in the laws, for example. Intermediary trust, we trust in the bank to execute our transactions. Now distributed trust, we are trusting now the logic of the networks and the protocols by which this networks operates on a technical level. So it's a new kind of trust, but we still need to trust it. And uh, I super like this uh, quote from uh, Ken Thompson. He gave in the 80s uh, when he got the Turing Award, reflections on trusting trust. Uh, and basically what it says, so to what extent should one trust a statement that a program is free of Trojan horses? Perhaps it is more important to trust the people who wrote the software. And um, the, the idea is, so trust is a, is a human and is a society concept. And even if we have those technologies, such technologies as Bitcoin, we still need to rely on something like, tr we, we still have trust, but now we need to trust the code and we need to trust the people that uh, wrote the code. So we, are, we will always have some kind of trust. We can just shift it to somewhere else. So just to get some of these arguments out of the way that people say, okay, when you have um, blockchain, you don't need trust anymore. That is a lie. You still need trust, but you move the point of trust to somewhere else. So this is a little bit like the motivational context and so on. 
And um, since uh, we don't have so super much time and I really want to go into the demo stuff, I will jump a little bit about above um, um, around the Bitcoin details here. So this is talking a little bit how Bitcoin developed over time, but it's not so important for us. Yes, many know Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency. And nowadays there are many different kinds of cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin and Ethereum are the most well known, um, but blockchain as a technology is much more than just a currency and a digital cash. Um, Bitcoin itself has a, a couple of interesting technical properties and it's useful to look at it uh, in Bitcoin to understand them better because Bitcoin from the design standpoint is a bit more simple than other blockchain technologies. Uh, at, at its core, it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network uh, that is used to implement a digital cash system. And um, nowadays we call those kind of systems distributed ledgers, distributed ledger technology, and it is a special kind of distributed ledger. It is a public distributed ledger because everyone can read it. And it's implemented as a blockchain. Blockchain is the data structure, which I will show in a bit what it is. And it's based on something proof of work. Many will have, of you will have known about it or heard about it. And it has kind of a bad reputation for um, using up too much energy. Um, but that is like an actually more complex story behind how the proof of work works and what is the intention behind it. Nowadays, it uses uh, more energy, but because of the... Um, more or less misuse of the concept of the idea behind Bitcoin. And um, yeah, there are some other uh, details here, which I'm not going into here now too much, um, but basically it has some Byzantine fault tolerant properties. Byzantine fault tolerance is a property uh, for distributed system that basically says that um, a certain a certain group of, of actors or of nodes in a network can be malicious or faulty and the network itself still is able to reach a um, valid consensus. And because um, Bitcoin uses this proof of work based um, consensus algorithm, it has a very good Byzantine fault tolerance threshold. So basically around 50% or less than 50% of the actors can be malicious and the network can still stay alive and reach a valid consensus. This is pretty good but still it is attackable and it has happened in the past. So you can attack and manipulate the Bitcoin network and the state by basically controlling more than 50% of the network, which is still possible in reality. And um, many think like uh, Bitcoin is the start of, of blockchain, but uh, or the first time blockchain was invented, I like to challenge it. And in the eighties, David Shaw, wrote his uh, dissertation on this topic, computer system established, maintained and trusted by mutually suspicious groups. And he is mentioning uh, chaining blocks and chaining hashes together. So in a certain way, he is uh, already talking about a blockchain data structure here. And we have another paper that is referenced here from the 70s. Mm. from a German cryptographer. He's also talking about chaining blocks together to make them more secure over chaining more and more blocks. Um, so this is the um, blockchain data structure in a simplified way. And basically the idea is we have, uh, we have a block. The block in, contains some items, normally transactions, but we can think of it as containing some payload. We will now generate a hash of the block and we will take the hash of the previous uh, block, we'll calculate a hash about both of the, or we'll save both of them uh, in our header. And then um, we will, uh, when we will calculate the next block, the previous hash will be an input to the new hash. So this is like a bit more simplified. And this is how it looks uh, actually. So the hash of the block is, the uh, concatenation of the transactions with the previous hash and a so-called nonce. Uh, what is now the nonce? Um, this is the answer or the solution to the proof of work. Um, and I hope now I go into the demo. Ah, no, this is like a bit of history to proof of work. Okay, let's skip this. But basically what this says, what I say here is that um, the proof of work in Bitcoin, mm, is also conceptually much older. It has actually been invented in the 90s. The concept of a proof of work 
<clears throat> and basically as a fee for regulating unregulated resources. And it was originally envisioned for use in um, email uh, sending. So as to combat spam email, you should not be allowed to send out so many spam emails. So therefore you needed to solve a proof of work, do some computation. And by proving that you did the computation, uh, servers would accept your email. And this is very cheap for the normal users, but this come, becomes expensive for spammers. Mm -hmm. And then there were extensions on this concept later on. And now the, uh, the proof of work that is used by Bitcoin is from 97 actually, was invented by Adam Beck and it's called Hashcash. Um, and basically the same idea. And here now I want to look in a implementation uh, for Groovy, how it can look if we implement such a thing in Groovy. And this is the um, uh, proof of work that is used by, by Bitcoin in a nutshell. So let's check out some code here. Um, all right, <clears throat> so oh, my, my throat is a little bit dry. So here, just some, some Ruby class, and it's just an example. It's not a useful blockchain or anything, but it's to understand how the blockchain data structure works and how proof of work works. So we have a Groovy chain, it's a blockchain, and this blockchain <clears throat> is created with a certain difficulty and, uh, a num and it will contain a number of blocks. And now what we can do with this chain, we can add data that is then mined into blocks and the blocks are appended to this chain. And in this case, it's very simple mining because the data you add just becomes one block and it then gets added. But not only gets the block added as we see here, also something is mined here. Okay, what is mining now? <coughs> if we look into the block and see how it gets mined, we can see the following. So first of all, Ah, oh, sorry. So in German, we would say I have a frog in the throat. I don't know if this uh, saying exists in English. So um, we, this is a function that can calculate the hash of this block. And the hash of the block is simply um, the previous hash together with our data and something called a nonce. Okay, now if we want to mine it, successfully mine the block, we have to find a nonce that solves our proof of work, um, uh, proof of work exercise. Some say it puzzle, but it's not a puzzle. Um, what is this exercise now? Uh, we have to solve. We have to find a hash collision, a partial hash collision. Um, this is what goes into here in the difficulty. <clears throat> so. We are, uh, and for this partial hash collision, normally a, a, a sequence of zeros is taken. So for example, two zeros or three zeros. Mm -hmm. And then we try to find a nonce that will lead to a hash that has a partial hash collision at the start of this hash with this number of leading zeros. So we are looking to find a hash that starts with two leading zeros or three leading zeros or five. And it becomes more and more expensive because the more we want to find, the bigger the partial hash collision, the more expensive. And we just increase, increment this nonce by the value of one, just try out every value, it's basically brute force. And this is proof of work, and this is a proof of work how it works in Bitcoin. And now we will check out um, how it plays out in practice. And <clears throat> yeah, I did this funny thing in Groovy to write my own benchmarking thing, but of course it's not a real benchmark, I'm sure but it's just a fun thing to do. So I, I added this um, benchmark interceptor. I, yeah, it's just something something we have in, in Groovy and um, I already get statistics on it. So it basically wraps my, I can, I can wrap my, my code, my message calls and count how long they take. That's pretty nice and um, um actually i get the calls and how long they take and so on and then i'm doing some calculations here to get the mean and the marks 
Um, actually, I'm not doing the calculations by myself. I just use a descriptive statistics class, which is from um, Orkipakos something, which is a fork of some Apache statistics project or something. Um, actually, I'm interested what Paul will present tomorrow in his data science uh, workshop about what are the state of the art data science and statistics packages on the JVM because uh, I don't really know them. Uh, this is what I found and what, what works quite well. But um, I think there are many other uh, and uh, it would be interesting to see what we have in the JVM and Groovy world to basically challenge Python, which has really great uh, Python and R, which have great uh, statistics and, and yeah, data science packages. So, but here we see I run different benchmarks with the different difficulties, like always mining 10 blocks. Actually, this will lead to mining 11 blocks. Okay. Uh, uh, let's just run this and we will see how the more difficult, the, the bigger the partial hash collision I have to find, the longer it will take. Okay. So here we get these solutions. So we see the easiest difficulty in the mean, it takes two milliseconds to find the nonce. So pretty easy. And then if we go to the highest one, which is five, here in, in the mean, it already takes 134 milliseconds. Or well, actually, this is still running, maybe. Yes, it's still running. Ah, this is a, <laughs> it's this one. So this in the mean takes uh, 134 milliseconds to find this nonce. And now it finally finished. So for finding blocks, according to this difficulty, it already takes in the mean 2000 milliseconds. So you see how it scales up. And by this, you can basically control the speed of your network, but also how much processing power miners need to invest. And uh, yes, really in, in the core, in a nutshell, this is how the proof of work of Bitcoin and many other um, blockchains works. It is just increasing this one counter to find this partial hash collision. That's all to it. It's really, really useless computation. But the idea is to, um, to, to not run it to, to uh, personally gain a lot of um, money like people do nowadays with Bitcoin. The idea is just that this is something that the normal users of the system collaboratively invest and each user just invests a little bit. So the problem we have now is these mining pools in Bitcoin that have all these uh, resources, this hashing power consolidated. And this basically skewed the whole idea of the network. And that's why the experiment Bitcoin failed in a certain way. All righty. This was just a, a small look into, um, into uh, Bitcoin, proof of work, how this works. And um, we will now dive into a different topic. So I will skip again most of the more theoretical slides here because I'm interested in showing you some real examples. So yes, there are different classes of blockchains, etc. but I'm not diving into this. Another super important thing that is always connected to blockchain as a con concept are smart contracts. And now smart contracts sound like something like a, like a contract in the uh, in the law sense, but it's actually not. Um, but the interesting thing is that always Lawrence Lessig is cited that because of uh, us being able to code everything and write smart contracts or whatever, code will become the law. So he always is cited that he said this. But this is not true. This is not true. He wrote this article and is pretty old actually from 2000. And here he said that lawmakers like governments need to be quick, need to be quicker than as the technology companies in adopting modern laws and making the laws work for modern systems and modern IT systems because um, else, and this is the last sentence, the law of the cyberspace will be how cyberspace codes it, but we will lo have lost our role in setting that law. So that's what I want, want to tell. If people say, ah, oh, if the blockchain community says, oh, Lessig said in a paper, like code will be the law and we will have smart contracts and they will execute the laws and so on. That's never what he said. He said, um, we should be aware 
of the dangers of technology moving so fast and forcing laws onto our society. And then society loses the control of writing the laws according to the society. Yeah, and I think we are in this danger right now with the big technology companies and so on. But yeah, just a little bit side information here. Whoopsie. Um, smart contracts as an idea, also a very old concept, beginning of the or end of the 90s from Nick Sabo. And um, he thinks of smart contracts in the context of a business transaction. And for him, an example of a smart contract is actually the logic involved in a vending machine that performs a business transaction. So you insert money, the code counts how much money is inserted and then gives you the product. So this is a smart contract in the original sense. And then the, in the extended sense, uh, he always con he already connected it to some cryptographic keys to making it more decentralized and then allowing cryptographic keys to unlock certain properties, mostly assets from the real world. So he gives always this example of a car only starting uh, if the lease has been paid or something like this. And this is executed via smart contracts that are executed somewhere. These are the historic uh, origins. Um, what we know, what we, uh, how we understand smart contracts nowadays is actually in the context of Ethereum. And I said before, Ethereum basically is, uh, in addition to the decentralized um, state machine, uh, also a Turing complete programmable state machine, Turing complete world computer, which rich statefulness, that's what, what people say. And if you build applications that interact with those smart contracts, they are called D apps, decentralized applications. And just to make it very concrete, that's how a smart contract looks. It looks basically like a Java class or a Groovy class. So it's now the storage contract. It has fields, it has functions. It is the same as objects. So programming with smart contracts is the same as object, object oriented programming. Just the objects are not living in your process. They are living in this decentralized network, in this decentralized Ethereum network, for example. Deploying a smart contract is you will call even then so when you deploy a smart contract into a network this is the same as calling the constructor of an object basically and then interacting with this one smart contract is like interacting with a certain object instance uh, okay this stuff is a bit too far i skipped this um, but now what i want to show in the remaining minutes how we can interact from groovy with smart contracts deployed on an Ethereum blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain in general. And for this, we use an application, a library called Web3J. Um, libraries for interacting with Ethereum are always called something with Web3 and Web3J is a Java implementation for the JVM. And let's check this out. So I'm having a smart contract here. It's the same basically as the one we saw there. So it has a number and it can store numbers and then you can get the number that is stored there. And so this is state on the blockchain, but you can change it. You can manipulate the state through this contract, through this, through this interface. Mm -hmm. um, so, and let's check how this looks. Maybe, no, this is boring. So I can first show this, maybe if it's fast enough, let's run this. There's a small group script. And here I'm just interacting with a live running Ethereum network that is just running in the internet at the moment. And uh, I'm just reading transactions or I'm just reading public information from it. And for this, you can, you normally connect to an Ethereum node, to some Ethereum node running. Uh, that is then your connection to the network. You will connect either using, uh, using uh, HTTP or WebSocket. Here I'm using WebSocket and I'm using Bloxburg. Bloxburg is an Ethereum network. There are different kinds of Ethereum networks. So there is this public mainnet, Ethereum mainnet, but uh, people can run their own Ethereum networks basically. And then they are their own network with their own state and proceeding state. And this Bloxburg network is run by the scientific community and I'm connecting to it. Um, creating this web uh, socket service. 
And then with the Web3 uh, library, I'm, I'm creating a client here. And here I again have the stats class from the um, Arcos uh, stat project. And now what I'm just doing, I'm just pulling out the blocks from this Ethereum blockchain. So I'm iterating over a number of blocks and I'm just uh, getting for each block number, I'm getting out the transactions that are part of this block. So there can be zero to n transactions as part of a block. Uh, and I'm just adding them to generate some statistics, basically. So I can do the same with, with Python and Jupyter. It looks a bit more fancy. I can directly easily generate graphs and so on. That's what I actually do as part of my normal research work. But you can also do it with Groovy pretty nicely. And I think in the future, when we get better data science capabilities, it will be super nice and powerful to do in Groovy as well, as powerful as Python and Jupyter stuff, probably. Uh, ah, I already run it. So you can see from these 101 blocks we, we pulled out here, yeah, we have uh, in in the mean two transactions in those blocks, and the maximum was 17. Whatever. So here here you see just how you can read from it, and it's just you see the send call. Uh, it's basically like calling a REST API or something. That's how you can read from a blockchain. You have to say, okay, which block I want to look at, then you can get the data in this block, like a REST API. Uh, but this is on the on the very low level, raw level. Normally, with Ethereum, you interact with a smart contract. And that's what we look at here now. I, I have currently, uh, wait, this. I have currently a local Ethereum blockchain running. Uh, this is Ganache. It is a, a tool for running a, a local Ethereum uh, blockchain for development purposes and so on. And um, yeah, I have a number of addresses here and I can interact with it now. And I just took one of those addresses, took the private key here. So this private key is obviously not a private key now anymore because you've all seen it, but it's okay. It's just development stuff here. Never use this private key now anywhere in your life because it's burned. Mm. So let's see how we interact with this blockchain. <coughs> Oops, nee. uh, I wanted to share the other screen. So now my uh, blockchain is running locally and I connect with HTTP here, but the same in WebSocket before. And um, I'm mm, creating this credentials object based on the private key. And now what I'm using here is storage. What is the storage thing? So uh, I have this smart contract here in Solidity, which is a programming language you can write smart contracts in. In addition, I have a Gradle, uh, not a Gradle, a Maven plugin, Web3J Maven plugin. There also exists a Gradle plugin. And this can generate a Java proxy class for this smart contract. And this is here. So this will compile the smart contract into Ethereum bytecode. This is here in the binary block. But it will also give me uh, proxy methods for interacting with a smart contract. Uh, and these are then actually remote calls over the network. And I can then use this proxy class to deploy it using this Web3J client, my credentials. And this is a certain amount of gas. I'm not going into what is gas, but get, gas is kind of a utility fee you use in um, Ethereum to execute transactions and execute smart contract code to pay for it. Okay, uh, so I deploy it on the network. Then I check um, the initial value that is on the ledger, that is in the smart contract. Then I interact with it just by calling the methods from it. And I always have to do the send to do the synchronous call. I, there's also an asynchronous API for it. Um, yeah, then I store another number and then we check what will then be the value. Then we store another number and we check what is then the value. Yeah, so um, pretty simple stuff actually. And yes, in the beginning, the new contract is zero. And then if we interact with it, um, the other numbers are saved on it. And if we check again in the ganache, we will now see that those transactions have been executed in the network. Like So Groovy and Web3J send it there and made this contract interactions. And state changing, trans, uh, state changing methods are uh, transactions that 
have to be persisted on the um, blockchain. Reading ones, not. So you can always read the current state, basically, from the smart contract and therefore from the blockchain, Ethereum blockchain. All righty. So uh, I wonder, probably Paul already said in a few seconds. Oh, he said 10 minutes left. So yes, I'm uh, I'm moving towards the end. Uh, yeah. Um, so yes, this is the Web3J stuff. There's another cool stuff from Web3J, which I haven't, okay, five minutes, all good, which I haven't personally tried out, but I definitely want to check out um, here. Sorry for the Kotlin example, but that's what I, what I pulled out of the documentation. Uh, it is a special J unit integration from Web 3 J, Web 3 J unit, and um, this is a way <laughs> that underneath uses test containers, which is even more funny, um, to test your smart contracts using the JVM basically. So JVM languages, Java, Kotlin, Groovy, and um, it will automatically spin up an Ethereum node in a Docker container and then deploy your smart contract in there. And then you can interact uh, with it using Web3J. And thereby you can basically write an a, a, um, a out of process black box uh, integration test against your smart contract. This is a pretty cool feature, I think, but I haven't tried it out myself yet. Um, yes, maybe as a small disclaimer at the end, uh, Oracle Cloud and blockchain, so, all the different clouds offer some kind of a blockchain service, blockchain as a service. And I would pers personally argue most of them, if you use those blockchain as a service offerings from a cloud, it's not a blockchain by most definitions of a blockchain because it's not decentralized anymore. It's running in a single cloud. Uh, Oracle uh, blockchain platform uh, is uh, based on Hyperledger Fabric, which is a different technology different than Ethereum, but also open source from the Linux Foundation. Um, one good thing about it is that it uh, allows connections with other networks. So the worst thing you can do is build a blockchain that is then running in a single cloud on a single cloud provider. Or if you are uh, multiple companies that want to do a blockchain together and you are all in Amazon or wherever, you are all in Oracle, that's not good. That's not the idea of a blockchain. Then you have not a lot of decentralization and you don't have those resilience capabilities that blockchain brings to the table. There's another funny feature in Oracle. It's called Oracle Blockchain Tables. It's a feature you activate in the classic Oracle database, um, but the idea is good. It makes the Oracle database an append-only database. And this append-only uh, rows are then chained using cryptographic hashes. So it is not a blockchain by the definition of a blockchain having to be a decentralized network. But for many, many, many enterprise use cases, when uh, the boss says, oh, we definitely need a blockchain, uh, you probably just need this, an append-only data structure that is secured against manipulation using string, strong cryptographic hashing. So, um, yeah, really think about when you need a blockchain. Normally, you only need a blockchain if you have many different parties or you have really public networks that need to interact with something. Um, all right, yes, thank you uh, very much. I, it was a, a great honor for me to be here at the virtual ApacheCon and in the Groovy track. Uh, and I'm always happy to get back in touch and stay in touch with the Groovy community. Um, and uh, yeah, then I, I also like to now introduce my new topic, blockchain, to the communities where I'm active in. So I hope this, this helped a little bit to make the, make the topic blockchain more concrete for you. And uh, yeah, if you are test containers users and you like test containers, very much we recently started this GitHub uh, sponsors program. So check it out if your company is a big uh, test containers user. And um, yeah, besides it, uh, <laughs> if you... Um, Want to discuss anything like i'm open for questions i'm now still in the session you can ask me anything or get in touch with me on twitter i'm always happy to nerd around about blockchain about java groovy about test containers and docker just uh, shoot me questions or whatever yep so we've got officially the uh, session finishes in one minute but there's no other uh, talks on today so um we can we can spend a little bit of time uh, chatting if people have got questions um 
But before everyone disappears, thanks very much, Kevin, for that great talk. It was, I found it very illuminating and it was um, yeah, great to see you doing some interesting stuff. Thank you very much. So I can't see any specific questions have come up, but um, oh, here's one. Huh. One, one is uh, being prepared. Yeah. So I'll thank for the feedback if this helped with a big picture. So that is one of my, my goals, was one of my goals to remove the magic from the blockchain topic. Um, the proxy class solely has static methods. Yes, correct. It has static methods. A couple of static methods, actually. Ah. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of anything they did in particular with regards to Groovy. The um, Web3J team is more looking into Kotlin, actually. Uh, and I think they want to um, do a new... Uh, version for with in Kotlin and their reason for focusing on Kotlin is because uh, they have a lot of users on Android and I think as far as I know Kotlin is the de facto standard on Android I'm not an Android developer at the moment but um, yeah basically circumventing the lack of Java features on the Android platform so um, I think currently they actually have like two different code bases, one for the Android that just compiles against Java 6 or what you have on Android, and then the other uh, for the normal Java. Um, using Groovy, you don't have to compile a wrapper for a smart contract and can use dynamic method dispatch to call contracts. Um, yeah, I don't know. So you still, you still need something to interact with the contract. So you need the bytecode of the contract uh, if you want to deploy it from your code. Um, or I don't know, maybe maybe you shoot some kind of a blog post or whatever, what you, what you talk or, uh, about specifically. Um, because I'm not 100% sure what you're hinting at here. So... The, uh, the wrapper is compiled from the Web3J plugin, but it also compiles the Solidity contract um, into Ethereum bytecode so that you can then deploy it. And I don't know, I, I never had a problem with uh, using this uh, plugin for generating it, but I'm very interesting in uh, if you found anything more elegant, of course. So thanks if you if you shoot me a message. That would be great on Twitter or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much. Thanks for the talk. And um, for people who are going to be around tomorrow, uh, my today, um, it's, it's I've got birds chirping and bright sunshine out my window right now. Um, <laughs> so later my today or your tomorrows, uh, there will be a data science workshop. Um, I've asked for a longer session to be set up so that the link doesn't disappear like it did for our hackathon. So hopefully that'll all be in place, but um, I'll be sending messages around frantically if that's not the case to uh, to, to tell you how we've remedied the um, short session uh, issue that we had uh, with the hackathon. So that should all be in place, and uh, the, the whole uh, workshop is all is all on the, uh, the on the web if you want to um, follow along at home. But um, you can I'll, I'll walk you through uh, interesting bits of it in the time we'll have available. And uh, yep, that, that will be to wrap up. Uh, th there have been- or, or which, which, uh, which statistics package will you use there? Or will you do statistics stuff? I do tiny bits of statistics. Okay. Um, and I do have Commons Math um, and some of the stat stuff out of two or three other packages as well. Co Commons Math, that was the one I meant. And the one I used is kind of a fork of Commons Math, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, 
descriptive statistics is a class that's in the commons math one as well you might have a, a fork of it or a variant of it yeah, yeah it's it's a fork it's a fork yes um yeah. so is commons math still alive do you know this yeah yeah um it's in the process this is not related to your talk too much but it um it's it's in a little bit of flux in the bits and pieces of it so there might even be a commons stat or something these days um the bits and pieces of commons math are getting teased out into uh finer grained uh things and then commons math will be sort of the, the leftover common stuff or whatever um so uh it might look some some parts in that sort of ecosystem might look that like they're almost dead but there's probably some new thing emerging in in uh some parallel part of the uh the uh, re repos that are uh, inside in inside commons so um yep oh cool. there's no join button soren should have a join button May maybe because the session has ended <laughs> um yep so maybe if we leave we can't get back in because of the uh, the, the session's ended or something i'm not sure what what that is but anyway okay um Otherwise, I'll see people tomorrow. It should be a moderated session, so I should be able to invite people onto the stage. Um, so anyone's welcome to come along and and uh, show me what the what what's been happening uh, if they try to run stuff and so on. So fingers crossed, we'll work out how that's working. Okay. Well, thanks again, uh, Kevin. Thanks for all the speakers uh, in the over the last two days, and uh, stay tuned to your Twitters and uh, other chat forums. Some of the tracks have been having uh, birds of a feather drink sessions at the end of days. Um, I'm not going to be doing one right now since it's my bright morning and I'm probably going to uh, get a couple of hours uh, sleep. But um, feel free to to jump in into uh, in, if you see a uh, groovy boff uh, around. But tomorrow we might, uh, at the end of the conference, we might try to organize something. Um, I'll keep an eye out for what other, other people are doing. It'll either be a Scotch boff or a groovy boff. We'll, we'll head for whichever one we can find. Okay, thanks everyone. See, uh, see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Good night or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's morning here, but yeah. Okay, see ya.